called Strengthening Gender Equality in Generative AI. It's organized by the United Nations Academic Impact in the context of the 68th session of the Commission on the Status of Women, which is going on right now. Today is the last day. The CSW is the UN's largest annual gathering on gender equality and women's empowerment. And this year, the Secretary General opened the two-week meeting remarking on the progress seen in every corner of the world and by listing some of the heartbreaking examples of the work that still needs to be done. Among his remarks was a call to action to all governments, civil society, and Silicon Valleys of the world to join a massive effort to bridge the digital gender divide and to ensure women have decision-making roles in digital technology at all levels. The United Nations uh, Academic Initiative of the Department of Global Communications engages institutions of higher education with the United Nations in supporting and contributing to the realization of the organization's purposes and principles, and in particular, the sustainable development goals. And today we are focusing on goal number five, women's empowerment. I'd like to just flag that the development of artificial intelligence has just exploded since the launch of the ChatGPT chatbot in November of 2022. And since then, the race to lead the AI market continues at an absolutely accelerated pace. This has brought tremendous innovation, but it's also exposed the threats, including gender bias in data sets, algorithms, and leadership. Research shows that gender inequalities are not just inherited, they are in fact amplified, and they amplify regressive ideas about women and girls in many AI applications. Today, we have four incredible scholars who are going to give us some background. And the aim of this panel is to inspire, it is to inform, it is to convene and connect scholars and young people and interested um, uh, organizations. And we hope that these wonderful scholars will have an incredible call to action for all of you. Let me just echo the SG's words to lead us into today's conversation. AI is a technology currently dominated by men, both at the leadership and technological levels. Evidence points to biased algorithms resulting from systems designed by men and that can program inequalities into all aspects of life, endangering men and boys as well as women and girls. The UN is working on AI as well. The Secretary General has an AI advisory board. UNESCO is working very hard in this area as well. And the International Telecommunications Union of the UN is also gathering stakeholders to build a common understanding of capabilities and AI technologies. And with that, I would like to welcome our first speaker this morning, Dr. Revy Sterling. Dr. Revy Sterling is the Senior Technical Director of Digital Inclusion at CARE and an Adjunct Professor of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. She has worked to advance digital inclusion for over 25 years, starting with algorithmic and pedagogical gender biases in computer science before moving deeply into addressing the gender digital divide. And before I pass the floor to Revi, I just want to note that we also have Dr. Kutuma Wakunuma, Dr. Jamie Stewart, and Ms. Constanza Gomez Mont, who are also part of our panel today. But first, we will hear from Revi. Revi, over to you. Well, oh my goodness, Jayashree, thank you so much. Thank you to my wonderful uh, other panelists that I get to uh, share this with and for everybody from joining around the world. It's really cool where I'm watching people go from, we had 11 in the waiting room and now there's 130. That's all very, that's all great. Uh, let me do a little uh, screen share here. Um, and I'm delighted to be here today. Thank you so much uh, to even be invited to this. 
Um, I can't actually, because it's Teams, uh, I can't quite tell uh, if people can see my screen, but I'm going to let Jayashree uh, yell out at me if she can see the screen and we're ready to start. Perfect. Wonderful. So anyhow, a delight to be here. My name is Revy. It's also wonderful to see so many uh, great folks that I know in the chat. So thank you for coming and, and uh, sharing. And I hope you uh, hope you get something from today. Um, I'm just going to start with a few uh, reflections uh, and try to set the stage for the next wonderful set of speakers. Um, but I will say that Every day in DC, I mean, D DC as we all know it, which is where I'm based, everyone's favorite question is, you know, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? I mean, there's memes about this, but it's no longer what do you do anymore? In fact, what I always hear now is like, what's your AI strategy? Where are you using AI? Um, and it's become sort of a new theme here, especially as you walk around the, the K Street corridor where all the NGOs are. And so being a, a technical lead at an NGO is hilarious because I'm asked multiple times a day, what's our AI strategy? What are we doing? So this couldn't have come at a better time, especially with um, with CSW just closing and, and, and what a great CSW it was. Um, and this just reminds me of the hype of AA, you know, the hype around AI as a development panacea. You know, it reminds me of the early ICT for development era, you know, that characterized a lot of the last 20 years. And I thought we were sort of getting out of it, you know, that tech will save the day where traditional development strategies and approaches haven't, you know. And since we never seem to learn from history, especially technology history, I feel a bit of deja vu with this misplaced exuberance about AI and its gender transformative potential. Um, and that's because because ICT for development, you know, my 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 home my home uh, uh, discipline did not close the gender digital divide. Like we invented it, and now we're spending a lot of time and budget trying to make up for the unintended consequences and also build an equitable, a gender equitable future. Um, and gender specialists warned us this would happen if we didn't put women at the center of development and tech programming. And I do remain optimistic that perhaps we can take 25 years of lessons on the gender and tech gap and pole vault pole vault right over a lot of mistakes and problems being uncovered now in these AI conversations that we're having, and we're having them earnestly, and I love that. Um, and people at this panel are going to take up, you know, some fascinating approaches on this. Um, and there's quite a lot of visionaries in the in the rooms themselves. So I'm really hoping that uh, you you speak up during the, the Q&A. Let me move to my next slide. Hmm. This is very bizarre. Hold on, trying to move my slide. There we go. Sorry. But let's get back to the generative AI and hope so I can set a bit of a table uh, for others. So if we look at development, the first thing that pops into my mind with the work I do, you know, are voice activated assistants and, you know, services that can, tr can tr transform text to speech and speech to text. If you think of the hundreds of millions of people who speak languages with no limited, you know, with no written form or limited written form, this gets pretty important for fighting information poverty and closing the gender digital divide, especially if edutainment programs, you know, if they can write themselves based on hyper-local experiences and dialects. I already see an uptake in chat GPT usage just in emails. Like people are letting the software step up their writing game and their communication game. You know, chat GPT, where the GPT stands for generative pre-trained transformer, you know, is now being used in all sorts of development, uh, you know, projects, tech for development products, where the pre-training is being done on large language models specific to industry and population. I mean, this is very exciting. So people can generate their own creative assets, you know, and better yet, create new products and artifacts entirely, which is kind of why the screenwriters, you know, the Hollywood screenwriters are scared. Um, and this automatic generation of content is something I want the social scientists among us to think about. You know, is content generation the same thing as knowledge generation? If we want to get a bit more curious, can generative AI be seen as some sort of digital form of participatory action research where the aim is the generation of new knowledge? Uh, perhaps we'll see the codification of indigenous knowledge um, getting its due respect as a data source, or perhaps monitoring and evaluation will become a generative process that organically forms, you know, from new data generation. I mean, I think impact evals are going to look really different in a few years, and that's probably for the better. Um, 
which kind of reminds us and takes me down the case of, you know, Gen AI was not developed for monitoring and evaluation or even for development. I mean, in our field, I think we think it is, uh, you know, it's developed for profit. You know, these systems are expensive, they're complex, they're designed to have a high rate of uh, return on investment across commercial sectors. You know, they aren't designed necessarily for the women that I've spent 25 years trying to focus on. And we're only learning that it takes, you know, we need to tame this generate, you know, generative AI beast if we're going to use it for good and, and not just uh, fun and profit. Um, but I'm also really excited that with generative AI, we won't have to pick between scale and depth, which has always been an intractable trade-off in development, especially ICT for development. You know, we either have broad programs with shallow reach and big numbers or wildly customized interventions for tiny sample sizes. You know, and I think when I was doing my dissertation research in ICTD, I think I made 33 communication devices. You know, it's kind of a small sample size when you realize that, you know, a third of the world has never been on the internet. Um, you know, and I, I do think that generative AI affords us to go big while being really responsive and adaptive to the individual. It's kind of the best of both worlds, you know, if we if we get it right. And for that alone, I think we're going to see more and more gen AI that is hopefully purpose driven, maybe even demand driven rather than the absolute top down shiny new object hype uh, that AI currently enjoys. And this is why we need to shift the agency of generative AI to the user. It can be a power shift. We always talk about women's lack of confidence to explore and use technology, but what if she's kind of the creator of the system, or at least the co-creator, to kind of go to my last point here. And we need to put generative AI in the context of all the other types of AI that I have on my screen. I'm listing some here, you know, data mining, machine vision, you know, where software can determine patterns better than humans, you know, even to robotics that can replace human effort and automate processes. I mean, computer science courses love using Roombas, you know, those little uh, robot vacuums, you know, to develop smart swarming algorithms. I've walked through many a Roomba battle, you know, in a lab on a way to a classroom. And at one company where I worked, we tried to send Sony IBOs to meetings to record notes and free up our time to write software. I guess that's now part of like Otter AI and other things. You know, now the IBO, you know, can probably just write the software itself. And just as an FYI, the, uh, the latest IBO, the ERS, 1000 features advanced AI capabilities, and they say it's facial recognition, voice interaction, and the ability to develop its personality over time and interaction with owners and its environment. And that should make house pets almost as nervous as Hollywood screenwriters. Um, but, you know, the hype factor is 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 real, um, but the potential is big. And like ICT for development and digital development, everybody seems to want to lead with the technology and not the problem. And what I hear again and again are, you know, oh, this AI is going to do this for this woman and this for this woman, and it's going to do this for her and this for her. You know, it's going to eliminate gender bias. Um, and every year for the last two years, when I'm asked what our AI strategy is, I am the first to say annoying things like, well, what problem would you like AI to solve? Um, and what would you like the AI to do? Um, and then I get a really confused look. Um, so I've stopped saying AI and I've started saying fancy software, which probably makes people cringe, but it really drives home the point that, you know, this is something that is actually developed, you know, as adaptive tools by humans for us to use. I was just in a wonderful workshop run by uh, Linda Raftree, who's just so amazing, where a few dozen of us commiserated over the pressure to do AI in development. You know, and why do we trust it so much? We've seen the wreckage of hallucinations um, and for, for those uh, hallucinations as AI generated data that's inconsistent with reality, you know, and so it's disinformation or nonsensical results. And this is because there's so many limitations and levels of unintentional or even intentional bias, you know, injected by the humans that write AI software, because behind every chatbot is an actually imperfect human, um, you know, or hundreds. And it might be great that I can make little watercolor pictures in in Dolly and put them in a slideshow, but you know, at the end of the day, um, that's not AI, you know, for development. And what makes me nervous is when humans are writing, you know, the AI is how many humans make great choices? How many of us adapt to change well, but we want the software to? How many of us can anticipate the actions of others, of the future? You know, we're hoping that someone else can correctly code for all the potential butterfly effects out there. 
And as we see in both life and AI programming again and again, even the tiniest disruptions in a system can result in dramatically different outcomes, you know, over time. And humans, we're nonlinear systems by design, and yet AI is supposed to make sense of the nonlinear. So what could possibly go awry? You know, anyone that's been around me for longer than an hour or a day at least will hear me talk about Conway's Law, which in 1967, we had a legitimate Western male computer scientist warn us that if we create systems imbued with our own biases, um, the product is going to result in that. Uh, I think that's why we have usability testing and other, because computer scientists are not necessarily the women we're trying to reach in these little thumbnails. Um, the computer scientists, you know, are coming from, uh, you know, these top 25 uh, companies that make 98% of the AI, you know, that is out there. And this is not to dis disparage computer scientists by any stretch of the imagination. But we have to go back to the human element, which is that, you know, the UN um, Social Norms Report you know, talks about how 90% of both men and women hold some sort of bias against women. So how is that reflected in software? You know, what are the software engineering students learning about ethical AI? What's being taught at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign or Berkeley or Caltech or MIT? You know, what in ethical AI is being reinforced at big tech firms and agile software startups, especially when big tech has disbanded so many ethical AI teams? Just, you know, just asking. Um, you know, to that end, let's see where AI really is useful. Oh, my slide didn't load all the way. It's useful in development. Um, and it was generative AI that automatically digitized some pen-based notes I was taking last week in the in the in the workshop with Linda. Um, and I think here's where the current state of generative AI, AI is useful, where we can protect a human life from danger, where we can automate the most boring and manual parts of our industry, and when we can't get informed consent fast enough to uh, to add photos to our to our uh, diagrams and reports. And I mean the last in as kind of tongue in cheek, but I did you know, just create this little image um, you know, on the fly. Uh, it's from Dolly 2, uh, and it begs the question, if we can generate fake participants in our annual reports, are we deceiving donors or are we protecting people's you know, dignity and images? But I hope as this non-real woman uh, shows, and perhaps she's hyper real or hyperial to, you know, to, to, to bring in some Baudrillard, because no doubt she comes from an amalgamation of lots of real women, you know, and maybe someday she will be using Gen AI on that phone to do something that benefits her uniquely, you know, and specifically. Um, and in the most directable, you know, and accessible form, because AI can do that if we can do this right. It can be a life coach in our pocket. And I want these life coaches to reach the women that absolutely need them the most and do it in a way that's safe and private and empowering and builds confidence and creates opportunities. And if we can provide that, you know, and it eliminates spam and noise and um, opportunities for technology facilitated gender based violence, advertising, you know, we just get her what she wants and she needs. I want that internet. Um, and I, we all get more inform, overwhelmed with information and hallucinations, um, you know, and as the resources become extremely more constrained, even in our worlds, I think this tech for her, um, you know, trajectory that we're on right now is going to become tech for us. And I think we're going to see more of that south to north tech transfer wave that started two decades ago with Ushahidi, with M-Pesa, with microgrids, because doing tech at the margins really does push the margins of technology and then we all benefit from it. But Thank finally, you, Ravi. Sorry. Okay, you're wrapping up. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Yes. Yeah, so Please. no, I just don't want to say is, you know, the, the final questions is development ready for AI and I would, uh, and is AI ready for development? Um, and I'm going to say yes, I go on a lot more with this, but um, certainly AI is ready for development uh, and I have a whole history of that that I'll do on a different talk. And is development ready for AI? Um, I'm not entirely sure. I think that, you know, it's just the third or fourth iteration of tech for development in a lot of ways. Um, it allows us to do better. We need to be looking at policies and safeguardings. We have to generate the generative AI that actually outsmarts gender discrimination, that outsmarts racism, and makes us better versions of ourselves, if not in day life, at least in, in, um, in uh, the virtual world. And that's where really the whole digital economy is going. So I'll turn it over and I'm excited to hear from everybody else. Great. Thank you so much, Ravi. I, I think that's uh, been a very helpful, you know, look and this notion of 
tech being able to save the day, but the human element in in programming and creating and replicating these biases that you were talking about is uh, is very, very important part of the conversation. Thank you. So next up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Katoma Wakunama. Um, she's a, an associate professor and interim co-director at the Center for Computing and Social Responsibility, DeMontford University in the United Kingdom. Her research interests and expertise primarily focus on current and emerging digital technologies and their ethical implications on modern society, both in the global south and in the global north. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Jayashree. Um, so let me just uh, ask if you can uh, see my presentation. We can. Okay, brilliant. Uh, I'll just, uh... Okay, so yeah, let me thank uh, Jayashree again uh, for a very wonderful, warm introduction. And then of course, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Revy for starting us off on uh, this uh, uh, discussion. And uh, more generally, I'd like to thank everyone who's been involved uh, in uh, putting together this uh, panel, particularly uh, Gosia. So thank you. I will begin my um, contribution by uh, looking at Antonio Guterres's uh, uh, 2023 Security Council uh, quote, uh, which states that uh, we must work together for AI that bridges social, digital and economic uh, divides, not one that pushes us further apart. I urge you to join forces and build trust for peace and security. And I think this is a, a, a very important uh, quote because uh, this is something that we're trying to do here um, uh, during the, this uh, conversation. We're trying to understand what has gone wrong in terms of uh, um, having uh, equal um, access uh, to artificial intelligence, what are some of the issues that women uh, actually face, and also trying to understand whether there could be any potential solutions that we can uh, we can look towards to uh, help uh, strengthen uh, this uh, uh, space uh, in as far as women are concerned. And so um, I think it's uh, very, very important uh, to be looking at, at, at artificial intelligence, uh, particularly when we're looking at uh, SDG5 and uh, trying to understand how technologies can actually um, uh, reduce uh, the gender uh, divide, uh, enhance uh, gender equality uh, in this uh, space. So SDG5 has nine targets and uh, one specific target actually looks at uh, the potentials of uh, uh, technology in empowering women. And uh, one a uh, specific uh, indicator is the ownership of mobile phones. So what this suggests is that um, the more um, access to mobile phones uh, that women have, the more um, it helps in terms of uh, empowering uh, women. And uh, at the time that um, the SDGs were being developed, there wasn't a lot of focus on artificial intelligence. Yes, artificial intelligence has been there for quite a long time, but uh, the focus has not uh, was not at uh, the rates that it's at uh, uh, during this particular time. And so now what we have to be thinking of, especially when we're looking at this particular indicator, is how we can um, uh, leverage the use of uh, generative AI through uh, mobile phones, because um, um, when we think when we think about it, mobile phones have become very, very pervasive. They've become very ubiquitous. Almost everyone has access to mobile phones. And so one of the things that we can be thinking about is uh, to understand how to innovatively use these particular devices uh, to uh, enhance education, to enhance our learning, particularly for women, because most women, especially in developing uh, countries, um, do not uh, necessarily have access to say, for example, personalized uh, learning experiences and through use of uh, generative AI, uh, this can be uh, possible. Uh, the aspect of uh, health and well-being is also something that can be useful, but, uh, particularly when we um, use uh, generative AI and also uh, the generation of business plans and uh, business ideas. Uh, when we think about it, uh, looking at uh, developing countries, there are a lot of women who are involved in uh, small scale businesses and those uh, women have uh, access to mobile phones. So why not uh, look at ways of uh, using generative uh, AI to actually help prop uh, women's social and economic standing in that particular um, area? But there are problems 
um, with achieving a SDG 5 because the statistics and some information um, that um, is there is that um, uh, artificial intelligence may not necessarily be easily accessible and that women may not necessarily have uh, easy access to, to, the inter to the internet. And so one begins to question whether it then becomes possible to really actually use this uh, generative, uh, uh, this generative AI to enhance and uh, uh, reduce uh, the, the the gender gap and enhance women's position. So, for example, some of the statistics. Um, so, uh, UNESCO's uh, report uh, of uh, 2023 indicates that uh, only 22% of um, uh, women professionals work in the area of uh, artificial intelligence, and this is mainly in the global. Uh, in the global north. So you can imagine what that means for women in the global south and how we can then leverage uh, uh, this type of information to enhance uh, uh, SDGs. That becomes a challenge in itself. A more recent uh, report uh, from uh, UNESCO, uh, it, and this report is uh, uh, one uh, that was recently published, I think a, a couple of weeks ago or a month ago. And uh, this um, uh, suggests that there are still uh, biases against women and girls in uh, large language uh, models, uh, and these biases are coming through gendered, uh, gendered word association. So, for example, uh, when it comes to female uh, names, uh, they're associated with uh, more traditional roles, such as uh, home, family, and uh, children. Uh, the report also indicates that uh, male names, for example, associated with uh, a much more uh, prominent standing, uh, suggesting that uh, men have a, a much more better uh, uh, economic standing. So for example, business, uh, executive salary and careers are the ones uh, that are associated uh, with male names. And only last uh, week, and I think uh, Revy can uh, support me on this because it's part of the uh, Women in the Digital Economy Fund. So I was privy to, to the launch uh, of this uh, particular uh, initiative, which is great for um, reducing uh, or indeed trying to uh, reduce the gap, the digital uh, uh, gender gap. Um, one of the, uh, I mean, some of the statistics were quite uh, surprising uh, or perhaps even shocking. But then again, we, we shouldn't be surprised or we shouldn't be shocked uh, when it comes to women and uh, their standing uh, with regards to technology. So, for example, one statistic was that uh, 1.5 billion women from low and middle income countries have no internet access. Uh, 259 million more men than women used the internet in 2022. And this is a uh, very uh, telling because um, what this means is that uh, either the gap is going to start getting uh, wider uh, as we get, uh, as uh, AI becomes mainstream, or that uh, the gap will become very difficult to, to reduce. And uh, what this means for women uh, could be uh, more uh, dis disadvantages uh, as we use the technologies in society. Uh, so the other thing uh, that uh, came out of uh, this uh, launch was that uh, there's uh, one trillion uh, dollars that has been lost due to the gender gap. And that if this gender gap were to be closed, uh, uh, approximately $524 billion would result. And so one wonders why this is not happening, because uh, it can only be a win-win situation if uh, we reduce the gender gap and if we uh, include uh, women uh, in uh, this arena of uh, artificial intelligence. Um, there, are, there have been illustrations uh, of, uh, or, <laughs> they're not even illustrations, these, these are real life uh, situations that uh, have been uh, revealed uh, from uh, books uh, that have been published by uh, great scholars such as uh, Cathy O'Neill, uh, Sophia Noble, Joey Bulamwini, um, Virginia Eubanks uh, that illustrate and demonstrate that uh, gender bias is still continues to this day and that uh, uh, this is problematic when it comes to artificial intelligence. And I think one of the reasons for this is that there is politics of power involved uh, in artificial intelligence. And this is not surprising because uh, uh, for the most part, a lot of us know that uh, technology is not neutral. And so because it is not neutral, it cannot be without uh, politics in it. And one of, these, uh, one of the reasons for this is that uh, because it is not neutral, technology should be seen as uh, value laden. It is value laden because uh, whoever is sitting at the table uh, when it comes to designing, thinking about uh, AI, developing, uh, implementing AI, 
um, has the power to decide what goes in, what is trained in terms of data sets and how the data sets are trained and what is embedded when it comes to uh, artificial intelligence. Um, and this is problematic, uh, particularly because women are not necessarily sitting at the table and we ought to be changing uh, that, otherwise uh, the inequalities will increase. And so we need to be thinking about uh, responsible AI when we're looking at that. And one of the ways that we have to be thinking about it is uh, looking at what is potentially wrong and what is potentially right, right at the beginning of uh, AI's design, AI's uh, development. <clears throat> Um, and so we have to be looking at uh, what we can do when we're looking at uh, design, development, implementation, adoption and use in uh, the environments that uh, we're in. So, for example, one of the things that we have to be uh, considering is the inclusion. Who is included and how we can include uh, uh, the different stakeholders, particularly women, and how also we can engage. Um, and I think this is very, going to be very important, particularly when we open the uh, AI uh, systems or designs uh, to different voices and to different experiences. And one of the most important things that we have to be looking at is um, having robust AI regulatory policies that actually truly speak to women's uh, needs, to women's uh, issues. Um, and I sometimes wonder if the regulatory policies that are around do truly actually look at women's uh, issues. So we've had the A uh, EU AI Act that uh, came into uh, um, uh, that was uh, implemented very recently. Uh, there are all these other AI policies that are happening, particularly in the global north. Um, but then we need to make sure that uh, gender is also at the center of this particular. Uh, uh, AI regulatory policies. Otherwise, we'll still continue to be talking about uh, gender differentials, gender inequalities, uh, even, you know, for years to come because technology is very dynamic and changes. Today we're talking about artificial intelligence, but tomorrow we'll be talking about something else. And uh, so this is where I I know uh, Jerry is uh, looking at the time. So um, for uh, additional more understanding of the work that I do, please, uh, you can access uh, the Responsible AI in Africa book that I co-edited with my colleagues, it's open access, and uh, it demonstrates a lot of the things that uh, we're doing in this uh, in this area and looking at uh, and looks at uh, the issues and also potential um, uh, things that we can do in order to ensure that uh, uh, AI is used responsibly in the global south, particularly in Africa in this case. So thank you very much. And that's my email address if I ever want to get in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katoma, for that uh, very helpful overview. I think you're quite right. The the statistics are are quite um, shocking. Twenty two percent of of women in this in this area working, um, and I, I thank you for bringing up the politics of power as well and the necessity for regulatory bodies to be involved and to center women because of the extreme biases that still exist. So thank you very much. And I I note that. Um, there is a Q&A, so if you have questions, please do drop them in the Q&A. And now um, it is my absolute pleasure to pass the floor now to Dr. Jamie Stewart. Um, Jamie is a senior researcher and team lead at the United Nations University uh, Institute in Macau. Jamie is also an applied cultural and developmental psychologist who specializes in computer human interaction and digital health and well being. Her work aims to support the creation of a safe, secure, and empowering online spaces for everyone, particularly women and children. Welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jayashree, and thank you to the speakers. This has been absolutely inspiring. Um, please um, do let me know if you can see my screen. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. So I'm going to be taking a slightly different angle this time around, um, which is uh, because I'm a psychologist by training and I'm working in policy at the UN, I'm going to be bookending by talking both about policy as well as psychology. So down up in the clouds and down in the weeds. So I wanted to first start off with a discussion of uh, the Women, Peace and Security Agenda as a way of framing artificial intelligence and as a way of framing security, digital securities. Uh, for those of you who don't know, and I'm sure most of you do, um, Women, Peace and Security Agenda came out of 
uh, areas of conflict where we understood that within the con within the context of difficult and dangerous spaces that women and girls experience disproportionate and unique impacts of that of conflict and violence that was adopted in 2000 and nine resolutions have come since the uh, the first national action plan for the women peace and security gender was in 2005 I just want to put something into frame this that um, of the, there are 177 countries that have a national action plan for the women, peace and security agenda. It's member states' responsibilities who are to, for the achievement of gender equality and the fulfillment of human rights through the WPS agenda. 30% of the national action plans that have been signed so far are currently outdated, having been expired in 2022 or even before that. Only, um, only three of the countries have signed uh, more than two national action plans. That has updated those action plans. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because we know that in the omnipresent uh digital technology that we're experiencing, of which AI, as has been said, is one of those um, technologies. Cyberspace is a critical context for peace and security, and yet um, we, we haven't necessarily updated uh, policies to reflect this, and the Women, Peace and Security agenda is not reflected in this at the moment. I wanted to say that in this environment, uh, we are security of women online is so, is so critical that one out of 10 girls by the age of 15 has experienced some form of harassment online and 60 percent of adolescent girls between 15 and 19. So what can we do to um, to join together or to actually bring the women, peace and security into um, into contemporary context? My work with UN Women, we've been trying to align the pillars of the women, peace and security agenda uh, to technology. So the four pillars of the, of the agenda are participation, protection, prevention, relief and recovery. And you can see here that we can actually think quite critically about how those look in relation to technology. We need leadership and participation, safeguarding of human rights, prevention in terms of um, detecting potential online harms and crimes of which women are much more likely to experience and recovering or gender responsive recovery. So within that context, women, peace and security, as it relates to technology or digital securities, there are some critical trends. I'm not going to be talking about all of them, wish we had time to do so, but I, I wanted to highlight that we actually do know some places, some key places where there's intersecting. And the one that I'm going to be talking about, obviously, is more to do with um, gender biases and AI, but I'm going to be particularly talking about how that filters through to, uh, to governance at a regional level in Southeast Asia. To start that conversation, I wanted to introduce, I'm sure, again, many of you already know, the ethics of artificial intelligence um, um, recommendations from UNESCO in 2021. I wanted to say that even though there isn't a lot of overlap between WPS and national action plans, UNESCO, uh, the UNESCO values from the recommendations really are quite oriented towards, towards WPS. They talk about human rights, living in peaceful interconnected societies, ensuring diversity, and they also make gender one of the critical policy areas, one of 11. And there's some really wonderful and substantial information for, um, for, for nations on how they can uh, uh, how they can unlock the potential of AI and and reduce gender gaps. So why is this particularly important, and why do why 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 how can we actually bring this into into a little bit of more focus around around AI? So one of the things that we know is that uh, that. Uh, AI is nuanced, and there are different functions of of AI. That is, uh, within a within a whole ecosystem, there can be AI tools that are actually built for peace. Things like um, cyber um, chatbots for cyber diplomacy. But there's also a lot of neutral AI, and I'm going to use the example of social media as a neutral type of AI. And the, your chat GPT maybe could be considered a, as a neutral type of AI. But there's also AI for conflict. What's important here to recognise is that all of these types of AI have the potential for potentially biased outcomes for women. That is, biased outcomes in the terms of discrimination, stereotyping, exclusion, and insecurity. And one of the critical reasons, as was said by the other speakers, is because these technologies often don't feature the voices of women in terms of their in terms of their production. So things that may not 
um, be meant for harm could actually still be used for harm or have unintentional consequences that are harmful for women and girls. What does this look like from a regional level? I think this is really important because we want to think about what, to, what do the obligations of WPS actually mean for um, nation states and for regions. So I've done a lot of work in Southeast Asia, and um, those of you who don't know, in February, 20, February this year, the ASEAN um, put out a guide on, on AI governance and ethics, which they uh, produced to the seven features for guidance on how to design, develop, and deploy AI in ways which consider their, their broader social impact. This is really important because AI is estimated to contribute $1 trillion to the Southeast Asian economy, and therefore it's actually considered to be incredibly important for many, many different stakeholders. This is uh, particularly interesting within the region is the fact that the Southeast Asian region is what is the but has the biggest variance in terms of AI readiness from the um, government AI readiness index, with Singapore being one of the highest um, readiness regions and um, countries in the world, and Timor Leste being the lowest. You can see the green line there is actually is the middle. So in terms of understanding across this context and where the critical areas are um, to to address this, how do we put the women, peace and security agenda or gendered issues issues into such a variable um, environment where there are so many critical issues to do with so, um, society and economy. And um, this is important because the, it, the guide just came out recently. We would like to know, like, OK, maybe that has human centricity in it, but does it have gender? And um, what I'd uh, unfortunately tell you is, is that um, the there is very little uh, gender responsivity in this document, um, although uh, gender and cultural diversity is mentioned two times. So this, this is the most recent one. How do we reconcile the national, um, the regional and national action plans to the experiences of women in the Women, Peace and Security agenda? I'm putting up this um, up this uh, this roadmap because it's work that we did with women, civil society, and human rights defenders, where we ask them how do we deal with the critical challenges of women, peace, and cybersecurity in the Southeast Asian region? And um, I think that's the way that we can bridge the gap. I wanted to say that although I did take quite a dire look at this in terms of um, the biases of AI and the gaps that there are in AI, the um, the woman that we talked to said. Uh, didn't actually see AI so much as a challenge, but more as an opportunity. And they centralised it as um, an opportunity for enabling WPS in their work, meaning that they could support them to streamline their operations, to increase their security, to promote their outreach. But they also recognise, which you can, pro which hopefully you can see in the key challenges here, is that AI also featured in things like increased hate speech, surveillance of women human rights defenders, and um, online gender-based violence. Violence. So there is an understanding of those risks, but there's also an understanding and a need for these um, AI solutions for WPS. And that then can take us to safe online spaces where, uh, where we have people over profit. And that is what, one of the critical things I want to kind of start ending on this, which is that how do we do people over profit? We need a human-centered AI digital future, which is a future that recognizes that AI can create opportunities, but also has, has potentially has the ability to oppress and harm. That design, develop, and de deploy thoughtfully AI can reduce gender digital divide. So what I would like to, what the one of the ways that I see this is uh, human-centered AI as being at the center human factors and outcomes at individual and collective levels, but we also need these kind of four critical elements of this flower, which is uh, um, human human centered design, human values oriented AI technologies, human rights protecting and promoting technologies, and AI that actually represents humanity. And what I mean by that is that those who are marginalized and vulnerable are included. 
Lastly, and this is my last slide, uh, I just wanted to quickly talk about psychological and health impacts of gendered AI, which is to say that women actually do experience more negative outcomes in terms of their health and well-being. And filter bubbles and echo chambers that are related to AI for women tend to result in greater mental health problems like anxiety, depression, body image concerns, and, um, and through the reproduction of stereotypes. But increased polarization polarization, misogynistic content, and I really want to highlight surveillance and targeting, specifically of women and women advocates, as well as anxieties related to digital technologies, specifically that have to do with um, replacement, and that is being replaced by AI, that impacts women and women's professions more so than men, as, as things are currently. But AI, we've also seen that can be really effective in identifying mental health issues and promoting well-being specifically for women who tend to feel more safe using chatbots around sensitive issues, specifically sexual and reproductive health issues. And it democratizes dialogue and support. Last, last but not least, it's good for everybody. We should do it because it's good for everybody, women, men, gender diverse people. It makes solutions more accurate if we're human centered and gender sensitive, it promotes greater innovation and it makes the world a more peaceful and safe place. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jamie. Really, really interesting to hear some of the statistics around how many young girls are experiencing, you know, hate speech, which sometimes is translating into gender-based violence, and also a very specific case study around these plans for the women, peace, and security um, agenda as well. And then connecting it back, I think, to women's women's health and the unique ways that women are targeted as well and some of those health outcomes that are, are unique to women. So thank you very much. Very, very interesting. So next, I would like to um, pass the floor to Ms. Constanza Gomez-Mont. She's the founder of C Minds, who works in the field of emerging technologies for social and environmental good. She's also a member of Women for Ethical AI Steering Committee, UNESCO, including the high-level group to draft the first global recommendation for ethical AI. Welcome, Constanza. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I'm sharing my screen. Um, let me know if you can see it. Um, there we go. Can you see it? Yes, we've got it. Okay, great. Okay, let me just move this over here. You can see. There we go. Okay. Um. So basically, um, work at CMINES. So at CMINES, what we're doing is we're working at the intersection of new emerging technology, society, and the environment. We're a women-led um, organization in Latin America, so I think the, the focus on gender equality and the questioning on a perspective of how can we work with emerging technologies that not only we mitigate the risk of gender inequalities, but also how can we harness their potential to be able to fight this? And how can we look Latin America as an innovation ground to present more and more innovative solutions towards the same, but also as a as a land and as a context to question the validity of certain AI contexts. So basically, um, what we're seeing here is that the AI systems um, where we're seeing like the bias and other type of um, gender inclusion aspects of this can be seen one through the AI model life cycle. And the other one is through the systemic view. So I'm going to talk more about the systemic view of, on this challenge. Um, one is a diverse teams and female leadership. So as we all know, um, we've seen this data all around, but you know, 20% of technical worlds are women, 12% of researchers are women, 6% software developers. And what we're seeing is not only this is happening in the industry level, but also in the academy where 80% of AI professors are men. Um, so we get to ask, okay, what does this mean? What does it mean to have a diverse team that enables more um, perspectives, that enables more creativity, that enables more competitiveness in the scene where this is one of the challenges? 
Also, we can see in the female founders scene, where 10 to 20% of the female of uh, startups are founded by females. So when we're talking about having diversity, we're not only talking about having diversity in data sets that create the AI models, for example, but we're also creating the diversity in all levels of decision making, not only from the hypotheses that are being formed when the creation of the AI models is being held, but also at the C level and all of the levels where we can have women voices represent and see that indeed these uh, solutions are both representative, but also inclusive at the core. When we're talking about certain specific solutions uh, regarding institutions, for example, what happens when you have dedicated funds for gender parity schemes? What happens if we have diversification plans in the recruitment processes? Um, in the governments, what happens when we have targeted efforts to participate in STEM and ICT programs for women? And in the investment sector, what happens when we have funding that is specifically led and specifically targeted for women entrepreneurship? So these are some of the actions can be taken on this systemic perspective on gender inclusion, where not only having diverse, as I said, data sets is, is a worthy um, cost to explore and a mission, but also the diversity in teams at all levels in these AI industries. Um, in Mexico and Latin America, we have different type of uh, experiences and solutions that we're seeing to it. For example, we are having more and more funds that are targeting women founders, for example, Amplifica Capital. We're having programs such as this one we exchanged led by IDB Lab, which are focusing on women's uh, empowerment and how can women have more access to both mentorship, funding, resources, and a supportive ecosystem that can beat the statistics of having, for example, 20% of women only being part of this AI ICT ecosystem. Um, in, in Latin America, um, such as in other places around the world, we have 5% of startups and scale-ups um, are founded by women, and only 2% have raised capital investment. So when we're talking about having an AI ecosystem that is diverse and representative, if we don't fix also the fact that women in entrepreneurship and in different levels and leadership positions, if we don't fix that diversity and if we don't give women a voice in these levels, then it is very difficult to understand and to be able to face questions as such, how can we have a more inclusive AI ecosystem and how can we reduce the bias? Um, what we're seeing as well is, for example, uh, questions such as retention and growth. Um, it's not only having the correct recruitment strategies to bring more women, for example, on board industries, but also what are the retention and growth strategies. Um, we've seen, and there's some very interesting um, reports that just came out, where 20 and 29% are part of the management positions are women. This in mid and mid market companies and other organization sizes, it's only the 13%. So we can see that as smaller it gets in the organization, the more challenges it presents in having um, women in these leadership positions. So the question becomes not only how can we enable more women to come in these industries, but also how can we retain talent? And what does that mean in different levels and different sectors? For example, there's a very interesting piece of data that just came out that 50% of women in technology roles leave them by the age of 35. And this has to do with array of causes, but from which were highlighted the micro harassment um, and this bro culture that exists in this industry that needs a very um, pragmatic solution. So from having institutions to having a maternity and paternity leave strategies to clear and strict harassment policies to leadership growth support programs, there's very specific things that both the institutions and all through the AI sector and the ICT sector can do to be able to retain talent from the bottom to the top. And this point is very specific because when we're talking about having inclusive strategies that work for the broad, broader population and not only for a very specific targeted group, which are normally men, we need to question ourselves and what are we doing as a society to retain um, talent at the very top. One of the examples, for example, that we're doing in my organization, C-Minds in Latin America, in our Women's Leadership Lab, is having a leadership path 
um, for, for women. So we, we're not only hiring um, and we're very conscious about having a gender parity in the team, for example, but we're also questioning ourselves and what are the best strategies to accompany women that enter, for example, as interns or assistants throughout the entire path for to have a four to five year trajectory where there is a mentorship program, there, there's access to resources, and what does it mean to have more women entrepreneurs? So basically what we've been doing in CMIMES is focusing on not only empowering women in positions of leadership within the team, but also working as a, as a practice. Everything they do within the organization is tailored for them to become entrepreneurs. Right now we've been, uh, we founded the second spin out of CMIMES where one of the directors that comes in and goes through this mentorship path is able to found um, their own organization and then create more ripples of change throughout this ecosystem. Um, and also questioning the AI for impact. It's not enough to understand how to mitigate bias from the AI life cycle, but also to question what in the sense can we see in general with the impact AI is having in the ecosystem. Regarding institutions and governments, for example, what happens if we invest in research that explores the impacts of AI across different demographic groups? Um, to ensure that AI development is guided by ethical considerations and societal well-being? How can we create more awareness of the impact um, certain AI systems is having in gender issues? And how can we empower different communities to have a very specific voice and be very change makers wherever they're working at um, towards this change? Gender inclusion and gender equality in the ICT sector is not only a topic that should be addressed, from the IC sector. It should be completely transversal to women and men in any type of um, industry and any type of uh, community. And that leads me to the fact that AI is not only, um, we have to make sure that there is a, a very embedded AI ethics and principles and values and strict guidelines and protocols and audits towards the systems to be able um, to make sure that we're not uh, making this gap even larger, but also how can we use AI to be able to fight um, these uh, gender inequality systems. For example, in the AI for Good Lab at CMINES, um, we've been exploring how to use AI to fight gender violence. What does that mean is how can we automate um, the reporting of system of certain governments, um, institutions, where they have tons and tons of calls of women being able to report gender violence? How can we use AI to automate the capturing of this information to be able to prioritize cases that need um, urgent action and how can government institutions have more and more tools to be able to respond to this issue both in Mexico and Latin America. Um, however, we, we've been seeing a lot of challenges in the sector and we know there's a lot to do still. Um, I want to share something um, that happened uh, some days ago when I was looking for pictures and you know asking GTPT to create some images for this presentation. And I asked, um, you know, for this data, you know, ask, please develop, you know, a 20 uh, image that represents 20% of technical roles of women in the industry and, and this um, specific data. And um, what I what I got back from from chat GPT was creating images that intentionally de um, depict inequality could reinforce negative stereotypes and may not effectively promote the change we want to see. So basically, I wanted a picture to be able to depict the inequalities that exist. And I got this answer um, asking me to, or rephrase the petition, or just to be aware that these type of images are a part of the pro problem because we're reinforcing certain messages. So it automatically asked me if I wanted an image that portrayed um, diversity rather than just having a specific role. So we know that the path is, is a very large, um, what is it? There's still so many things to do in this arena, but we are working um, as a community to understand what are the best solutions, both at the AI lifecycle level and at the systems level. For example, I was part of the drafting committee for the AI ethics artificial intelligence um, recommendation. And um, I remember that we were we were presenting the proposal to include a gender section on it. And everyone was questioning this because they said that the gender part was already covered in the bias and the data um, data sets, you know, the challenges of diversity in data sets. And it was it was impressive how we had to fight kind of back to say that gender requires a whole chapter. Why? Because we need gender equality strategies that are both transversal, that are can be accountable, 
that can have very um, specific strategies that work not only on the AA life cycle, but also in the general um, ecosystem as a whole. And lastly, um, UNESCO founded the Women for Ethical AI Network, which I'm also part of, that can become a very a specific asset to answer these questions as a community. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Constanza. Um, so really interesting to hear, e even about your your fight for inclusion of a specific chapter on on gender. That's fascinating to me, and I'm so pleased to hear that you were there and you were in the trenches and you managed to make that happen. Um, and that really is inspiring to to hear. And I, I think your point also about you know the investment that has to be made in in this research to make sure that the development is is ethical as well and figuring out what are those um, safety nets, what are the principles, the values, the guidelines, the audits, et cetera. You know, this is like a huge scaffolding that has to be built um you know to to regulate and to ensure that we're we're not just um you know yeah replicating these kinds of biases and also i was kind of blown away by the number of women that leave the field you know around the age of 35 some really interesting um statistics and and just to say Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're going to go into a Q&A session now. Um, so uh, just to see the powerful um, presence of these four women and the other women working in this space to create greater equality. So we're just going to take a look at some of the questions here. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Revy, there's one for you about cutting through the hype and acknowledging uh, the hard road ahead, finding ways to deliver the good while minimizing the proven unintended consequences. Is development ready for AI? So do you wanna take that question and, and kick us off on the Q&A and we'll come around to the other speakers as well, please. Sure, but this time I'll aim to be a little more brief. Um, in any case, I do think I think development is ready for AI in a way that it wasn't ready for tech for development. Um, I think those two fields sort of collided into each other. There was a lot of ICTD stuff. There was a lot of development. We didn't have a very happy marriage. Um, there's still a lot of, uh, we have a lot of strange children. Um, but I also think that in this space, because there's so much interest because there's so much funding because there is so much potential you know this is driving a set of conversations that are happening you know at a much more um grounded and inclusive perspective because as jamie said we need to get this right for everybody so I, i'm going to stop with that i put a few resources in the q a chat but i'd love to hear from others amazing thank you ravi for that really appreciate that um, so, uh, Katoma, there's a question here for you as well. Thank you for the great framing of the data on gender equality in the context of AI and including evidence of the real challenge ahead. When we think about responsible AI and the unfolding regulatory space we so badly needed yesterday in your dream world, what would you want to see in regulation that's not getting included or what would you like forefronted? And if there's anything else in in the chat, Ravi, or sorry, Katoma, that you um, would also like to answer, please. Right. Um, I, I think um, what's uh, important is really to um, ensure that uh, aspects related to gender equality are not just a, a, a box ticking exercise. Uh, because I think that's what tends to happen. I mean, a good example is what uh, Constanza has said uh, when they tried to uh, introduce the the specific gender uh, section, and then they were like, "Oh, you know, it's already uh, covered in uh, in bias and things like that." And so this actually suggests that there's a shocking level of ignorance uh, regarding uh, women's and women's uh, uh, take up. Uh, uh, of, of this uh, of this space, so we need to make sure that women's voices are heard. But I think the most important thing is to ensure that during all these regulatory policies, uh, that uh, 
creates this, these responsible AI innovations, that women are sitting there at the table explaining their experience and not just being invited to present their experiences. They ought to be there genuinely representing um, the experiences and uh, the needs and how these technologies actually impact on them. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Katoma. Um, Jamie, there's there's a question in the chat for you about other, um, you know, publications, but but I'm also interested to hear hear from you, Jamie, as your researcher. Can can you tell us a little more about what you think the role of researchers is in addressing the some of the regressive trends in generative AI? Oh, good question. Yeah, I'll, I will answer the question about the publications. We're actually at the very last stages of the work with with UN Women, which um, combined across AI, WPS, as well as cybersecurity and cyber resilience. Um, I'll keep, uh, I'm happy to keep people updated. That um, roadmap that I showed everybody is available online. Uh, we also have an e-learning module for women civil society and women human rights defenders that is currently in the last processes. And next week, I'll be in Bangkok doing a training for trainers of human rights defenders. So this is a wraparound piece of work and that actually feeds into what you were asking, Jayashree, which is what is the role of researchers? So I'm an, an academic in the UN <laughs> straddling, straddling both sides of this. And I think that the role of researchers in not just in the UN, but within civil society and, and within universities more broadly, uh, is to take an evidence-based approach to actually bridge the gaps here. What I see from my, um, you know, and I am a, an applied researcher who's worked a lot in communities, and what I've seen in my work in the in the digital sphere with, uh, with uh, many women is that uh, there are so many barriers in the in the discourse. The way that we talk about training capacity building, the uh, even the 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 idea that we uh, that we've kind of disconnected the storytelling element of this, which is let's how do we bring people to the table? Let's talk about how we use technology, what it means for us. Let's actually take more of a narrative approach to this, and let's talk about where it's harmed us. Let's not be afraid of talking about the fact that the language that we use is inaccessible to many people, not just women and girls, but there is some sort of level of um, the technocentricism and technosolutionism that, that we need to kind of minimise to make to make this more accessible for everybody. And that is the role of researchers, not to make it less accessible, to make it more accessible and more evidence-based so that we don't just keep on recreating the same thing. So we need to take our skills into this environment in order to bridge the gaps, not just write papers or reports, but actually do wraparound services that are inclusive and when we say meaningful participation, that we actually mean it and we um and we we're not we're creating those platforms for people. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. I, th I think that's a, a really helpful response on the on the role of research. Um, Constanza, uh, there, there's a question in the chat and it's not directed to anybody, but you, you may be positioned to answer it, but others can jump in as well. This question is saying that I, I'm noticing that donors are jumping to funding prototyping or scaling AI builds, some state ethical AI builds, but there doesn't seem to be funds for the research and foundational thinking that needs to go into truly exploring technical solutions for gender bias and the social processes that would need to support it. Are others witnessing this trend or what would the speakers like to see in terms of, of funding streams? So I'll I'll maybe pitch that to you first, Constanza, but there mother maybe others who want to answer that too in, in this group, please. Of course. Um, I definitely see that there's a big gap that we have to close in funding uh, for these type of solutions. Um, especially, um, there is a special interest in, in the Global South. How can the Global South, as I think it was Revy saying, how can we see and, and push for the possibilities of what can be done in a context where, all, where already the inequalities are so large and so big and the lack of opportunities are so profound. So um, we not only need to focus on having targeted funding for these type of applications, but as well questioning that all type of funding for any type of AI development should include the ethical lens 
on what is being developed. So I don't only think that we should have to have a targeted pillar, but also question it as a community, how can we widen the scope of investing in any type of AI development that has to have the ethical lens and how the investment sector can be a mobilizer for this prioritization. Thank you. Does anybody else want to add to that particular question? Yeah, I mean, I, please go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just going to say that uh, I, I think uh, it's it's very um, surprising um, when you know you look at uh, all these uh, calls uh, uh, for say um, to develop a certain uh, AI applications or digital technologies uh, so that they can enhance. Uh, uh, development in in uh, you know developing countries but there is there's nothing related to ethical issues and then we be, we 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 become uh surprised when uh we realize that there are digital divides happening within these particular spaces amongst women, amongst uh, uh, policymakers and civil society organizations. Um, and then we go back to the, uh, to the same discussions talking mm. about, uh, oh, you know, we've developed these technologies, but we have these issues. And that's because there are no ethical considerations uh, in, in, in uh, the development of these uh, te technologies. And it's very, very important that uh, we address these. Mm. And I'll just I'll just piggyback on that to say I agree you know absolutely with what's been said. I think that you know we don't do a good job of safeguarding this enthusiasm. We've got to put the guardrails on. You know we've got to look at the fact that you know um, pilots have always been dangerous in digital inclusion work and digital development work, and yet they are very necessary. But we even need to ground them in more. Um, uh, you know, thoughtfulness in, in these approaches. Um, a, a, you know, well, there's a lot of history about pilots and, and, you know, across the board. But the other thing that, you know, I'd like to realize is that, like, for this latest call of proposals that we're doing, I think Katoma had YDEF on her slides, which has been my baby lately. You know, you have to have, to even be considered, you need to have um, mitigation policies in place around GBV, online, offline, et cetera. We weren't even talking about AI, just tech for dev, um, mm. because you're playing around with so many power relationships relations. You're playing around the fact that, you know, you have unempowered women that are unempowered by design, by their community structures, and yet you're giving them this very powerful tool set. I mean, I think the reason why the last billion women can't get online is because a lot of their communities don't want them to. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we need to, you know, stop thinking that everybody wants empowered women running around with information and people will do anything to not let that happen. And AI is a great tool for doing both, both of those things. So we need to be super, super, super thoughtful. Hmm. Can I yeah. just um, briefly comment on that as well? Thank you so much Please. for saying that, that Revi. Um, and it's something that, uh, as I said, in the work with human women, human rights defenders and women with civil society organisations, we've been finding that issue coming up constantly. And I want to say as well, you know, um, to, to be clear, this is something about being a uh, being very public and being in the very public eye. So this is not just um, advocating for, for women's issues, but advocating for contentious social issues and how AI is de potentially deployed by um, by APTs, you know, these, uh, and uh, that is advanced persistent threat actors who are well-resourced, who are sophisticated, and the tools and technologies that are emerging so fast and that they are being used for, for purposes of targeting and surveillance. And there are there are many stories all around the all around communities um, in terms of the way that this is being used. I want to say one potential way of doing this is really good and really well embedded risk assessments. And those risk assessments have to be gendered risk assessments, where they look at issues of women, peace and security, as well as discrimination, stereotyping, and exclusion. And there's an overlap and, and an overlay in terms of these, uh, uh, when decisions are being made. And I, I also did want to say that, you know, like uh, the reason why I pulled out um, the UNESCO recommendations is because there is a there is a chapter on gender in there. But what we're seeing is that is falling off in terms of the other um, governance frameworks for exactly the reasons that um, Constanza was saying, that we're folding it into other things, but we can't. We actually need to separate it out. Mm. So there are 
Yes, thank you. Really, really insightful answers to all of you um, on that question. There's so many great questions in our in our Q and A on the side on the chat. Um, we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. But just since we're on this, you know, kind of topic and understanding how the kind of ethical frameworks and these guardrails, I think we're all in agreement that these are definitely needed. But you know, whose responsibility is it? to ensure that these kind of regulatory practices and regulatory frameworks are, are put into place. And, and I, I'm just throwing the question out to all of you, like where, where does the responsibility land on that? Because there's a massive gap here. So we'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on that. And then we'll go to a few more of the questions in the, um, in the chat. So it's so hard. I think everybody probably <laughs> feels it. And I'll um I'll just mention very quickly my thoughts on that and pass over to Katoma. Um I think that uh especially when we're looking at, you know, I've been talking about governance and one of the reasons why the EU AI Act could pass through is because there could be a legal framework around that. In many other regions, you can't have that. And um, I think what I want to see happening is we're actually revisiting much better national action plans and the obligations for, for gender equality um, that are they're based in those foundational documents and bringing them bringing them into our discourse now. So um, I don't I, I do think that we have to have global solutions, but they have to be localized. And um, global solutions sometimes and frameworks may not have the uh, the same impact. Uh, as local solutions do that are actually oriented to um, to people's lived experience. So I don't think we can say it's just the the buck stops <laughs> here. We need it at multiple different levels. Um, uh, yeah, I totally agree with you, uh, Jamie. But I think uh, <clears throat> policymakers play a very, very important role in this. So they are going to be responsible for the most part of it. But I think... Um, um, having different stakeholders contribute is very, very important. So we need to be looking at uh, CSO uh, contribution, for example, because uh, uh, in the Global South, for example, CSOs play a very, very uh, important uh, role in terms of uh, awareness, in terms of, um, you know, understanding uh, people's um, uh, uh, situations, and these can easily feed into the policies uh, around responsible AI. But I think also because policymakers are always playing catch up with uh, technologies, because technologies are very dynamic, you know, tomorrow you can be talking about uh, one uh, technology, the next day it will be something else. And so it becomes very difficult to have uh, robust policies uh, around the ever dynamic uh, technologies. But I think if we can also include uh, the private sector, who are usually the experts, uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, provision of uh, these technologies, uh, then I think we're onto a winner. So different stakeholders will play uh, will play different roles, but I think one somebody has to take, or a specific group has to take leadership, and that is uh, policymakers. Mm, thank you. I see Constanza and Ravi, please. I also would add there, um, so the also the potential for the consumers and users to have an active voice in this. For example, we were doing a, a policy prototype in, in Mexico, you know, working with startups to, for them to include these ethical guidelines within their work. And one of the very um, honest questions we had from these startups was like, there's, there's a lot to, we have to invest a lot of resources, a lot of limited time that we have as a startup to be able to do this, you know, the, this ethical guidelines and the assessments you're asking, and you know, it's resource intensive. Why the, the, our consumers, are you sure that our consumers care about this? Because we're working to have a certification on AI ethics, but it's, it is not giving us an advantage over our competition. Um, so it was a really interesting, you know, um, questioning mm -hmm. that is a very valid questioning. So um, uh, jumping into, you know, thoughts about that, how do we work with the consumers and how do we work with the demand side of having ethical companies and ethical protocols and ethical products? So there can be a, a more honest conversation both ways, both from the supply side, but also from the consumers that demand it and that prioritize products and services that prioritize ethical developments. Thank you. Ravi. 
I just love what's being said, and I, I think I'm going to echo uh, all all of these voices next time I, I uh, talk to people about this. And I think that for those consumers that are a little more sophisticated, um, that do care about this, that realize that this is an important issue and might have a little bit more of a voice, I'm thinking of, you know, being more involved with internet governance fora, you know, at the at the country level. Uh, you know, policymakers, you know, can't ignore IGFs, um, and IGFs always have, you know, both a gender and an AI or emerging technology mandate. I look at the work that AP. Association for Progressive Communications is doing. You look at the work that UNESCO and UNFPA and UNICEF have done in this space. There are resources, there are groups, even feminist AI, you know, online groups. Um, if you, uh, you know, trying to find somebody from, you know, the A plus alliance that, that might be in your community. This is why we have LinkedIn, right? You know, we have to go find the people. Uh, we have to have these conversations. Um, and uh, we, and I think that there's more of an opportunity for this because I think with tech for development, ministries just like to point to each other. Oh, tech should do that. Oh, broadcasting. Oh, gender. Yeah. Oh, commerce. And no one really wanted to touch it uh, because who wants to do something for women. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, AI, you know, because of what it stands for and represents and affords, you know, all it, countries are running towards it. So we need to take advantage of this and be just super smart. No one's better at building coalitions, you know, than women when we need to accomplish something. And so this is that time right now. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so the, this is another question that I, I think is um, helpful and broad and all of you could please um, contribute. This question is asking like, what contributes to the low numbers of women in AI in the, in the space um, across the sectors that you're all working in and mentioned? And the second part of that question is what can be done to encourage more women to break into that space in both global north and south due to the varied perspectives and intersectional considerations that play in these contexts. So interested to hear what what people's thoughts are on that as well. Please go well, ahead, I hate, Jamie. I would hate to go back to, I mean, we, we do have 30 years, you know, organizations like Anita Borg Institute and uh, National Center for Women in IT. I mean, we know why there's fewer women in computing from the 80s downward. I mean, that's a very well understood phenomenon, that kind of incredibly leaking pipeline. Um, perhaps it is swinging back this way because now you can have somebody that is an influencer, you know, who's never been, who isn't a technologist. I mean, maybe we're coming at this from the wrong angle and trying to find, we're trying to add women to tech, you know, you know, now we're adding more tech to women. And I think this might be a different, I think we're standing at a at a really interesting inflection point here, but um, I'd like to get, uh, other people are smiling on the call. So I'm going to be quiet and just put that out there. Please, Jamie, go ahead. Uh, I, I'm going to take a very psychologist point of view here and say mm -hmm. that um, that stereotype thread and internalized stigma is huge here. But um, there was, uh, I was actually just, I'm going to present exactly on this topic tomorrow, Women Tech Makers Hong Kong. And I found a really wonderful piece of research that's not so wonderful, but that talks about um, women and the types of stereotypes that they experience within tech. And um, some of those, those stereotypes that they experience uh, not very many of them are, are good stereotypes about women being competent in tech. Let me just say that. But what I the, what I wanted to say to you about those is stereotypes are endorsed not just by men but also by women. And somewhat I, I sorry I can't remember who it was that said about the gender gendered norm index. Um, I think that would have been you, Revy. Yes, eight out of ten people have um have uh, stereotypes against women. And one of the critical ones is stereotypes against women leaders. So the, it, some of the issues. That that we have here in terms of gendered norms is that yes we are taking them on and other women and as well as men are policing in that space and then there are other issues that um that feed into that which are around uh caregiving and um and lives and contexts of complicated contexts of women and um and our roles uh and how that Inter intersects with uh, masculinized norms within tech, which I, I know somebody else said said bro um, bro coding and the, the, that type of culture. It really, really does impact. And uh, one of the things that was said in terms of they've got this whole pipeline, girls not coming into education, girls dropping out of education in STEM, 
not being hired into STEM roles and then not getting career progression. It is not happening in one place. It's happening at every single space within the pipeline. And that's happening not just from men, it's happening from women and it's happening within ourselves as well. So we need to break out of this um, and empower women at the different places, put supports in and around those places where there are critical drop-off spaces. Um. I don't know if I can uh, jump in, uh, but I suppose I, I should. Yeah, go yeah. ahead, Patron, uh, and then we'll hear from Constanza as well. Right. Okay, so I think one of the, the, the things that uh, really uh, affects uh, this situation is the fear, fear of technology. Um, sometimes just the word technology or even AI itself, you know, uh, most uh, women, I think, uh, please don't <laughs> uh, lynch me on, on that, will just think it's it's uh, something really difficult and so they will not necessarily want to engage um but i think uh, i'm comforted uh, by the fact that uh, now we have uh, these uh, young people who are really engaging with uh, technologies with all these uh, wonderful apps and um they are leading the way like you know my uh, 13 year old daughter now i'm i'm asking her about how these uh, uh, some of these apps are, are working and sometimes she's like oh why don't you understand this uh, it's very easy you know and <laughs> Uh, and uh, it, it's a, uh, it, and I think it happens across across the board. It's just that uh, sometimes we're very uncomfortable about these technologies. But it's it's good that the young people are learning about these technologies at a very very young age. And I think this is where uh, the trajectory is going to start changing. So we need more education. We need more awareness. And uh, yeah, we just need to stop fearing technologies. I guess. Mm. Yep, please, Constanza. I would definitely add um, one is our res responsibility, kind of a global community, to highlight the cases that are, are working. You know, what are the applications that are doing it right? What are the institutions that have an amazing retention and leadership uh, policy? What are the governments that are having a, a transversal strategy regarding this? So one is let's start to hear more specific case studies on how we can do make this happen, because I, I think we've all in so much data of how this is impossible. Let's start to hear these very specific case studies that are, are changing the needle on this. And second is when we talk about women, um, it, it is not a homogeneous um, group. You know, mm. we, we do have to realize that there is an intersectionality need to talk about this agenda and a context-based agenda. So just to make sure that we, when we take these conversations to the local level, that we uh, we address the fact that we cannot put all women in a box and that we need diversified um, strategies to face this. Thank you so much. I, I'm just feeling so energized by all of the incredible insights all of the extraordinary research that all of you are doing, all of the incredible work in the field that you're doing every day in an area where it's, it's a big uphill battle. And um, I feel like you're all out there representing many, many women who may not be in a position to even advocate for themselves um, in, in this area and just in, in the general sense of, of the numbers of women that actually live in poverty that the secretary general mentioned um, with the CSW. There's so many other barriers for women that they're facing um, in addition to these, these very serious challenges in AI. But um, it, it gives me a lot of hope to hear the great thinking and the great work um, that is happening. And I think, it, you know, to your point, Constanza, about where are the case studies where things are working well, you know, this is where we need to lean into and figure out what are the best practices that we can engage in. So what I'd like to do is maybe just give one more round to each of each of you to just say, you know, if you have a, a particular call to action or a particular thought you would like to leave everybody with today, um, I'd just like to give you all maybe another minute to sign off um, before we close today. And a huge, huge thank you to all of you for, for making time. So if I may, um, maybe we can just go in our order, starting with Ravi, Katoma, and then Jamie, and then Constanza. Please, over to you, Ravi. The floor is yours. 
I think my final thought is that if you're very serious about adding, about adding AI to development programming with the intent of closing the gender digital divide, reaching more women, et cetera, you really do your homework. You look at the stalwart orgs that are already testing, that have done this, that understand their communities so well. I think of things like Digital Green and Gramvani and Viamo and orgs that have done this for a long time and are really looking thoughtfully at this so that we don't fall back into a really a dangerous pilotitis type of awareness. Um, and I'm always happy to chat at any time. Let's reach out and, and, and keep these conversations alive all the time. Thank you, Ravi. Over to you, Katoma. Um, I think for me, really, it's uh, if we have to have a, a truly responsible AI that uh, takes into account women's uh, voices, that takes into account women's uh, standing in society, we must have them sitting at the table. These women have to be truly involved uh, in all the processes uh, of uh, artificial intelligence. It doesn't matter what it is, doesn't matter where these women are coming from because their difference, their experience is going to be different, but they have a better understanding of how these technologies can impact them. They, they have a better understanding of how these uh, technologies can help uh, them uh, become socially and economically uh, well. And uh, so we need to make sure that they are we're listening to them, that their voices are truly uh, heard and that their voices are inspiration because women truly have something to add to the table and we must listen to them. Amazing. Thank you. Jamie. Um, I think what I wanted to say is echo a little bit what Revi said very early on, which is uh, we we know a lot about technology, we know a lot about people, we know a lot about gender inequality, all of these things we know a lot about and we shouldn't be swept away in the hype. What we actually need to understand is about people's lived experiences and what that means in extended spheres of life because digital technology is one of those. So this isn't um, the next, there will be a next thing and a next thing and a next thing. And if we treat this situation in the same way we've treated other technologies, that is with fear or um, with complacence and apathy, then we're just going to end up recreating the same things over and over and over again. So if we want to see uh, representation, if we want to see inclusion, if we want to see universal access, and not just access, but um, meaningful access where um, women and girls and everybody from marginalized communities ha are afforded the same opportunities. If that's really what we want, we need to learn from the ways that it, that that we, the inactions that we've had before, the fears and um, and what's holding us back. And we actually need to bring that to the table in order for us to move forward. One way that we can do that is stop recreating the wheel. We have too many frameworks, I believe. We need to synthesize and move forward. Mm, yes, thank you, Jamie, appreciate that. And just before I pass to Constanza, um, there is a survey that's in the Q&A window, and we're just asking if as many of you as possible can um, fill out the survey as well. We'd be so grateful. It helps us to um, improve our, our programming and panels. But please, Constanza, over to you. Um, with one sentence, I would say, let us not forget that when we talk about gender equality, we're talking about social justice and equity. And that there's tons of resources that exist for institutions and communities that want to do something about this. And the Women for Ethical AI is one example of an international network to tap into one of these um, missions. And Constanza, can anyone join the Women for Ethical AI? Right now, where it's the, the network is helping governments advance this agenda. And yes, you can send an email and to see how there's different levels of participation. Okay, great. And where would folks send emails to um, to connect? They can send it to me, um, Constanza GM at um, CMA.co. I, I can share that as when differently, and I will send them to the um, the person that I see that. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So again, a huge, huge thank you to all of you for joining us and really a, a major thanks to, to Revy, to Katoma, to Jamie and Constanza for taking time today to share your expertise, your knowledge, your research and your insights with us. It's been inspiring um, for all of us.
Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, thank you to thank you, you as everyone. well, and thank you to the organizers for Absolutely. putting this together. What a great way to end CSW. <laughs>